Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. So this is Li Wired's live living room sessions. My name is Jen Ward-Clark and today we are going to be joined by Mahmoud Patel to chat about how his passion for regenerative agriculture led to an ecotourism business. If you've missed any of our sessions over the past few weeks, don't panic. The recordings are always available on Wired or CPRI's Facebook page and our live living room sessions are now streaming to YouTube as well. So please visit us at Wired's YouTube channel and subscribe. Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education and Design brings you these sessions in collaboration with the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, CPRI, and powered by the Inter-American Development Bank. Stay tuned each week as we continue to bring you some thought-provoking and future-focused discussions with a wide variety of professionals on the topics of climate change, regenerative agriculture, biodiversity, and renewable energy. Last week, we asked you, our viewers, to let us know on our Facebook polls about the best time for you to join in. Overwhelmingly, our viewers have asked for a 1 p.m. time slot. So we're pleased to bring you our new time slot starting, time slot starting from next week of both Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Today, I'm thrilled to be hosting Mahmoud Patel, who brings an interesting perspective to the table. Beginning his career studying business and economics and holding degrees in literature and cinematography, Mahmoud spent the earlier part of his life in the film industry. However, as the world span and the tide turns, Mahmoud is now the owner of Ocean Spray Apartments, an apartment hotel on the south coast of, of Barbados, as well as Cocoa Hill Forest, a 53 acre lush green rainforest turned agroforestry project. Mahmoud is on a mission to preserve natural heritage, promote food security through regenerative agriculture, while creating a more resilient business and personal life. I'm not going to elaborate too much because Mahmoud has so much passion for his work that I will let him speak for himself. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mahmoud. Good afternoon, everybody, um, to the whole world. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for joining us, Mahmoud. It's lovely to see you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for the opportunity. Wired and AADB and CPRI um, sharing some ideas and thoughts and the discussion. So, Mahmoud, let's just launch straight into it. I'm I'm thoroughly excited to hear you speak about your life and your work today. Um, lots of people have multiple businesses and multiple passions that don't always align with one another, but it's not as often that one man has as much purpose as you do. You've created a marriage between tourism and agriculture, which goes beyond the simple concept of ecotourism. Uh, it speaks about heritage, bush medicine, green therapy, regeneration of the site that you're using through permaculture principles. Um, so I think that what all of our, our viewers would be interested in right now is to hear a little bit more about you and how you got here. Um, can you walk us through some of the factors that influenced your shift from the creative sector through tourism and onto agriculture? Well, I would say the first premise is always try to do where possible um, the things you like to do or look at the low hanging fruits that if you want to say God gives you or the universe or the creation gives you. If you have a talent for lighting or color or painting or singing, that is what you should grab or what you like to do. And so in some ways you don't ever have a job but you have a life. So work doesn't become a nine to five experience, but it becomes an all encompassing 24 seven experience. Um, <clears throat> I've always been in, uh, you know, I've been a filmmaker for a very long time, in, initially in the theater industry in Barbados. Mm -hmm. And then a group of us decided that we want to become uh, into cinema. And then I went to NYU and studied cinematography and directing. And we, you know, we had a film festival here, workshops working with the Caribbean and so on. And then the 2008 recession happened mm -hmm. and it effectively upended um, the funding in the Caribbean for, for cinema or film production or even for festivals. And then, so, then I had to say, okay, here's the moment now I have to reinvent myself and go back to what other low hanging fruits I had before. And it was food. Um, you know, I have a, and my, and my heritage is from India. My grandparents so my mother's side were farmers, kind of practicing what I do now. Mm -hmm. um, I used to own another business with Russell Corey Nature Care. Mm -hmm. and, and being in the hotel industry, um, 
realizing that a lot of guests will be asking me, Mood, uh, why you have all of this imported food, you know, an Italian or German accent, and I would hang my hat in shame because I know I had a food heritage. And, and so those were some of the triggers to, to, to look at reinventing myself um, and what, what we needed to do at that moment in time. I thought, okay, food security would be a major issue. If there was one thing to look at right now and then, and even more now, was the idea of food security. Absolutely. And food security is a huge issue, uh, primarily right now. But um, what I'd like to go on to next is um, your view of the tourism industry. So how did you tie food security and the tourism industry together? Much like your journey from the creative sector to regenerative agriculture, um, the world didn't stop, to so the tourism industry was evolving and we are evolving right now as well. Um, so you mentioned the guests at Ocean Spray were demanding a tourism product that wasn't mainstream. They were asking about uh, authentic experiences. They were asking about local foods, things like that. Um, what, uh, what would have led you to move from pure tourism and view tourism as the means to an end product as, as opposed to just purely tourism? Um, well, again, go back to the artistic side. I remember was in Senegal directing, uh, working on a film for Senegalese director, and he was telling me in his French Wolof English accent, Mood, uh, you people in Barbados are very stupid. And I was like, well, what, what, what happened, dude? Um, no, because everything you put in your mouth is imported. And, you know, the first art is food. See the plate as, a, as the, see the white plate as a, a blank page or a blank screen. Mm -hmm. And if you ever want to talk about creative industry in the Caribbean, you have to fix your food issue. And I've been to Barbie, he was he'd been to Barbie several times. And I was like, I'm flabbergasted of why you eat so much imported food. And I, and I think that was one of the triggers for me in the reinvention as well, that food is also art. And uh, agriculture can be artistic as well. It doesn't have to be only farming. Um, for my economics background, I have always, always taught and especially in the way that we in the Caribbean has always had monocultures or monocrops. Mm -hmm. You know, it was sugarcane at one time and then you cut down everything and just plant one crop, export that and buy everything back. Mm -hmm. That never st struck me as a sustainable model. As, you know, maybe a post-independent, post-colonial, post-slavery cultures now. And then we moved from sugarcane into tourism. And I was like, well, we kind of gone into another monocrop again. So we move from one monocrop to a second monocrop and really don't do a sustainable, diverse kind of uh, economic structure. And so for me personally, it was like, all right, this is a, this is a, 2008 for me was a transformative time. It was like, all right, try to fix the problem. I mean, don't try to change the whole world, but at least try to fix what you can fix in the circle that you have some control on. And so I was like, okay, let me go on a journey, find some land, and then um, start to plant food. I remember also, yes, one thing. I remember one time going into the back room, kitchen, inventory, kitchen, or storeroom is, and looking at all the um, items on the, on the shelf. I was like, wait, pineapples, we could grow that. Tambrin, coming from Thailand, we could grow that. And on and on, it was almost 25 things on the shelf that was all imported from the distribution sector. And I was like, this is crazy. This can't make any sense. We get, we, we earn a tourist dollar, mm -hmm. let's say for room sales or whatever. And then how much does leak back out through everything else? Like the, 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 the mm -hmm. consumption of power, the consumption of food mm -hmm. and services and so on. And I was like, we have to find a better system or a better way of doing this to keep the, the, the tourism dollar in the economy. And also, I mean, you know, further than that, all the hurricanes in the region and all that speaks to that food security is really an important thing. And so I think I started that small journey on my own, then okay, go and buy a piece of land or lease a piece of land or whatever, and start the journey yourself, however, and by whatever means possible. That's a very interesting perspective. And to add that, to circle back around to our question, which was not viewing tourism as the end product, but as a, a means to, to an end product. Um, the, the concept of value-added products that you use in your, uh, in your cafe is quite phenomenal. Um, 
certainly there were problems, obviously, with the food security issue and with the tourism sector prior to COVID. Um, you mentioned that the guests were asking for the local fruits, um, clients were changing, that the whole tourism world was changing. Um, you needed to, uh, we needed to come to a realization of this, which perhaps COVID has brought that to a head at this point. So if you can explain to us a bit more about Cocoa Hill Forest then, how have you brought together the hotel and the farm to create something that goes a bit deeper than traditional ecotourism? All right, so the idea was um, with the forest, we, coconut, Cocoa Hill Forest is really and truly Coconut Hill Forest. So we can come back to that in a second. But the idea was then, okay, let's, let's look at um, grow what you eat, eat what you grow, uh, ethos or a metaphor, and that, um, you know, we, we should create a menu or recipes or whatever out of what we can grow and make it real trendy and sexy and interesting and so on. Mm -hmm. And so if we can only grow 10 things on this island, then we should create the food around these 10 things. And I'm taking reference from the South Pacific islands like Tonga, et cetera, where they grow mostly coconuts, bananas, ginger, um, tanya, tanya, which is a kind of edo, and so on. And they, and they make variations of these five or 10 things in whole set of recipes. So that, that became part of the, the backbone of, uh, of the structure of uh, the farm to table ethos. So for instance, in the cafe, we don't serve English potatoes anymore. We use sweet potato only and we use edos. And, and slowly the idea was to get rid of or plant stuff that we can then replace. Um, and, so and so in, your cafe, in your cafe at Ocean Spray, would you say, are you 100% local? 80% local, 75% local? No, I, I, I mean, the journey to become 100% local would be, it, that's a long term and that's, that also would mean structural <laughs> changes to the Barbadian economy and more people being on board. I would say the idea, the idea would be to change, okay, so we import 70 to 80% of our food. The idea would be to turn that equation upside down and maybe say that we import 30% of our food and the 70% we can grow here. And if we could achieve that, we would have you know, done a fantastic thing. Yeah, excellent. So can you tell us a bit more about Cocoa Hill Forest itself? What is the project like? What are you doing there? So, so when we first started out, you know, we were the idea was to plant coconut trees. Um, that's the base crop of the project. I call it the tree of life. It can give you water, milk, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, plus the all byproducts. I mean, there are tons of byproducts you can get from coconuts. And then with that, we call it vertical farming. Under the coconut tree, we plant bananas, and then under the banana trees, we plant ginger or turmeric, lemongrass, etc. And so we use this idea of vertical farming in, in intensive ways. The other thing too is that Cocoa Hill is in the Scotland district in the, in the hills or the valleys. And some part of Cocoa Hill, maybe a third of it was sugar cane 210 years ago. Mm -hmm. So part of it, the regeneration part was, okay, let's take this abandoned land and, re and terrace it and make it uh, fertile again, make it useful again. Because the other factor there is that 17% of our land mass is in the Scotland district. And for the most part, it's abandoned. And I'm not sure that's a sustainable way to, to, to map out a few, our economy. We have 17% of the land mass not being used. And so my, my idea behind that was to look at terrace farming, regenerative agriculture, mixing all that drainage and so on, and come up, come up with an ecosystem that will create a sustainable space but also a fruit forest and, 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 a, and a food basket. So we grow, I mean, we have, we have about 40 to 48 types of fruit trees, uh, pineapples, uh, all kinds of sapotes, um, avocados, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, different herbs and spices that we've been growing. And basically out of that actually became the idea of a repository. Exactly. Because because what happened there was that then I started to look into the history of Barbados uh, using Lijon and uh, Schomburg and then seeing what we used to grow, what we used to have, and realized that we have lost a lot of uh, fruit trees and, and flora. Also speaking to um, Sean Carrington as well, mm -hmm. and that we have lost a lot of flora because of the same sugarcane monoculture. 
And then slowly but surely we started to become a repository. So in some ways, like for instance, we have we have collected 11 types of bananas, seven types of coconuts, um, tea, for instance, um, and you know, different wild coffee and, and, and coffee as well. The, the two varieties of pineapples that we used to grow in Barbados mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. That's amazing. We, uh, I, I'm assuming that most of our viewers wouldn't even know that there are 11 types of uh, bananas available out there. So the fact that you are collecting those species and using your property as a repository is amazing. Um, guys, if you're just joining us now, my name is Jen, and I am joined today by Mahmoud Patel, who is going through the creative sector to tourism and now on to regenerative agriculture and agritourism has been an interesting one. Um, we are taking live questions from the audience, so please post your questions in the discussion below the, below the video on either Facebook or YouTube uh, to get our attention. And don't forget that the replays of these videos are always available uh, on Facebook and as well on YouTube. And we are actually honored today to be joined on YouTube by the sixth form geography and environmental science students from Queen College. So welcome. Uh, going back to our discussion then, Mahmood, um, in permaculture, so Cocoa Hill Forest is a permaculture site. You're, using, you're uh, employing as many permaculture principles as you can as, you, as your site evolves. Um, there's a frequently used phrase, so the problem is often the solution. And as you pointed out, as we look back through history, uh, we saw an agricultural decline with the end of the sugarcane trade. The solution was tourism. So through tourism now, we are seeing a decline in agriculture. Our, our, all of our efforts have gone in one direction and not the other. Um, and in light of our current circumstances, the tourism industry stands to be slightly in jeopardy, slightly might be an understatement. Um, but you've shown us a good concept through agro-tourism. The income streams are diverse, um, and it appears to, it, it, it's going to appeal to a wide cross-section of tourists as opposed to a, a, a streamlined set of people. Um, so my question to you is, what, what's the issue? Why hasn't agro-tourism in Barbados flourished already? What are the challenges that you face? Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a very... <laughs> Difficult question to answer. Why hasn't agro-tourism in Barbados flourished? Well, um, <laughs> so I think maybe you can start with some of the challenges that you might have faced in trying to get this off the ground. You you have two really great projects underhand. What 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 are some of the issues that you're looking at? All right, I would say, I mean, gosh, man, um, access to land. You know, we have, again, again, we have never had a land distribution, land reformation policy in Barbados. And at best, it was tokenism with the, um, the Tenantry Act. So land, land is wealth, land is, is, is everything, really. And, and access to land, in fact, actually, that was the, part of the biggest problem. It took me two years to find land. And thank God to Mr. Bell, I must say that. I'm gonna, he, he basically gifted me this land. I mean... I could go in, that's a whole other story. I mean, I bought it, I paid a mortgage for it, but effectively has gifted, gifted me this land. And it, it took us two years to find something. And actually land is a very difficult land to, to, to work because of the erosion issues and so on, but it is what I could afford and then I found solutions to, to fix the problems. So I'd say access the land, um, if, and especially if you're young and whatever, it's, it's not easy. And then actually, Financing the our, our banking system is is is, is risk averse to anything that smells of agriculture, and I could and I could, I could say that I've took more than one institution down there, and they lent me the money to buy, buy the land, the mortgage, but not to actually build it out, to plant the coconut trees, or to create the cafe, or the trails, and whatever. And if I was told more than once that they would, in the banking institutions would prefer to give me loans. Or mortgages to continue building more apartments but mm -hmm. to be honest I was, i'm not interested in that for me i saw the bigger challenge and 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 a much better future in the land 
in, in, in growing food. And that's where I would like to be. And it's, so even today, it's still a challenge to access uh, equity or funding or venture capital to really, how can I say, uh, attain the possibilities or the potentials of Cocoa Hill Forest. It's still a challenge. And so I, I suspect that in, on a general level, it's there are lots of incentives to go into the hotel industry, both fiscal and otherwise the marketing structure and so on. Yeah. The, 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 you know, the, the institutions that surround tourism and ring fence, it does not exist in agriculture. Mm -hmm. The second, the second challenge we have in our culture with Barbados is very two simple things, which is predial larceny and the problem with the monkeys. Mm -hmm. I hear that as a refrain from every single farmer. You know, we need to fix these two problems. Otherwise, it makes no sense in going into farming. The the other thing too is that again, I think the the the, the trauma of of monoculture or monocropping economy is still with us. Because the other question begs that why have we not done agro processing? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, agriculture is one thing, it's primary, uh, but we should be doing tertiary production or value added production, which makes then agriculture more sexy to younger people, you know, making by products like jams or cheeses or juices or uh, medicinal products that you could easily sell to both local and the on an island tourism market or even export. And that, that's what's going to build agritourism as agritourism. Would you say that you have seen an increase in that over the past, say, five or six years? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. I would say that <clears throat> some shifts have been happening that we now get guests coming to Ocean Spray because we plant food and that want to come and help do what you call voluntourism. There is and it's, there's a definitive shift, even on the cruise ship, uh, guests that come to do hikes and tours that you know, I call it positive tourism. Tourism could be a, a good thing. It, I totally believe, for instance, that tourism should be the platform that we build out these other industries, like agriculture and agro-processing, et cetera. Absolutely. So yes, definitely a shift in, in, the, in the tourism or the guest uh, expectations. Absolutely. So um, your project at Cocoa Hill, it's its definitely a work in progress. Um, it's not without its challenges, I'm sure. I'm sure there's more challenges than what you've outlined to us here today too. But um, when you walk into that rainforest and you're looking over the East Coast, I can speak from personal experience, you exhale, your shoulders drop. It is, it's green therapy, as you call it. That would be a phrase that I'm using from you. Um, it's, it is heritage, it's biodiversity conservation, and it is agritourism. So your plans might still be in motion, but there is a mission that you're on. Um, what I wanna know is what's your plan? Where are you going from here? So what does the ideal future of agritourism look like in Barbados? You know, as an artist, I, I would say art is healing, it's ritual, and it's symbolic, you know? And I've, I've always bought that with me, even when I try to do my other businesses like the hotel industry or definitely Cocoa Hill, and that everything I, I try to touch should have a sense of healing. Mm -hmm. And um, in some ways, doing regenerative agriculture could heal because it's going back to the land and, and capturing what you have lost Maybe it's it's somewhere healing the trauma of, of the sugarcane industry. I would say in one aspect, um, the uh, because because the the location or the geography of the forest, you know, about a thousand feet above sea level, very green. We have the Atlantic air coming in. Um, that was also a low hanging fruit. It is a therapy to walk through Cocoa Hill Forest. Absolutely. You know, it's something the Japanese have been doing for a long time. They call it Shurin Yuku. Um, or forest bathing, in that you walk through a forest very slowly with no real purpose, maybe bare feet, um, and and you breathe in the forest air, and um, you know that that exactly that, that picture there gives you an idea of, of part of the forest, and you walk through that with trails, and you touch them, and you hug, and you go barefoot, and the idea is you breathing in an uh, oxygenated trade winds. 1600 miles of clean pure air coming up the east coast um that that was a, a product that we created as a as a revenue stream to help to pay for um the actual agricultural side of the product 
So this is an opportunity that you're offering to your guests at Ocean Spray, yeah? To the whole, like, to everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. To, to everybody. And initially it was Ocean Spray. I mean, okay, yes, good. You uh, here, Here's an interesting part. When I first started, it was only an agricultural project. I had no idea to do trails and hikes and tourism because I was already doing tourism on coast. But economics and challenges and so on, you know, evolution and, and if you have a problem, you find a solution. The lack of funding meant that I had to evolve to keep the, the project going to help to play, pay for the, uh, the, the fruit trees and so on. Mm -hmm. And so we started to develop additional experiences in the forest. Um, for instance, there's uh, yoga platforms or you can just sit on the platform and breathe in uh, the trails and, and the green therapy. Mm -hmm. I think we have a photo of the yoga platform there, which is a, a lovely space to be in as well. Um, yeah. We can bring that one up shortly. So um, can you talk to me a bit more about what your future plans are? So looking at the marriage of the agrotourism, so the marriage of Cocoa Hill to Ocean Spray, what do you see going forward? We, 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 you mentioned to me prior to this a bit about a food basket um, and some future plans for the property. Well, I am um, so, so after seven years of making tons of mistakes, you know, and learning and, and being, yeah, we go. you know, I've, I've, I can't say I have full confidence, but I, I'm, I am somewhere in, in the, that direction um, that this is working. The terracing works. I mean, you saw when we did the cut and drop and, um, <laughs> and after years of collecting coconut leaves and, and other leaves that it actually start to augment the soil and we could plant ginger and that. I am confident that we could re-terrace the entire Scotland district and turn it into a food <laughs> basket. And yeah, I mean, that would be a job. That could be an example. Um, what I would like to do is to find a way to work with what I call food scientists, um, agriculturalists, this was, um, and then some chefs, and grow a basket of goods. If it's 100 things or 200 things or, I don't know, a list of 50 things, that one can can be nutritional, and that can help with our diabetes and hypertension on the island. Mm -hmm. But that can be grown locally, and then you make really cool recipes from you know really trendy and sexy and all of that Instagram friendly, so to speak. <laughs> and we, we work with Jason Howard, and uh, you could look for his uh, Instagram. You know, really good ideas there. But to come up with a basket of foods or a basket of goods. It could be herbs and edos and yams and so on, coconuts, ginger, whatever, and really say, okay, this is what we eat here. This is what we grow here. This is what we eat. And if, if for instance, it's sheep and goat, but not cows, then that's what we consume here. Mm -hmm. But at least we would own our food security. And I, I think that's part of the, the, the trending that Cocoa Hill will go to in however possible. And, and, and um, personally, you know, for instance, we would make our own pineapple and, and ginger jams. That was my next question. So we make added products that you already produce. And, and then where do you see that going as well? Right. So the idea would, so then the idea of Cocoa Hill also would be to look at agro processing. So you grow all these crops and you start to do what I would call um, artisanal agro processing. Maybe in the first case that so you could scale it up with other farmers. So right now we do at least for guests, you know, our own juices, uh, pineapple and ginger, watermelon and mint, uh, turmeric and orange juice. The orange juice is imported. Uh, the oranges are imported. And then we make our own jams, a banana ginger jam or pineapple ginger jam when we have enough pineapples in stock. We make our own um, mousselis as well. And then the other thing that we do because we grow lots of bananas and coconuts is that we try to make, you know, all kinds of banana breads and all kinds of banana byproducts and the same thing with coconut. We use coconut in nearly everything. Same with ginger. So yeah. there it is. It's a look at agro-processing now. And I would say that would be the third um, triangle of the whole project, Ocean Spray, is where the accommodation is, uh, Cocoa Hill where the actual agriculture is, and then look at agro-processing and value adding or tertiary production of what we do. Because again, that, that was part of our history. We never did tertiary production. You know, we, we would export the sugar cane and buy back everything else. Mm -hmm. and so we should we should also look at breaking this what I call bad habit. Yeah, Absolutely. this cycle. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, CPRI has actually been lucky enough to come out to Cocoa Hill Forest on a number of occasions. We've partnered with you um, to produce some of our um, perma blitzes. So a perma blitz is essentially a one day gardening event um, where we've come out to Cocoa Hill. And during those events, our volunteers help to uh, re-landscape some of your terraces plant banana trees. So we're getting a little bit of gardening therapy in with your green therapy, um, making use of your lovely platform that you have. And we have been lucky enough to be the recipients of some of your value added products. The coconut bread I can say is amazing and the juices are amazing as well. Um, so we thank you for that. And we, we look forward to partnering again in the future when we can gather together in groups. Um, guys, if you're just joining us right now, my name is Jen and I'm joined today by Mahmoud Patel. Um, he's, his journey through the creative sector to tourism and now on to regenerative agriculture and agrotourism has been an interesting one. We should all be taking notes uh, as Mahmoud poses agrotourism as a potential solution to both food security and tourism in a post-COVID Barbados. And I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about his uh, theories on that. We are also taking questions live from the audience, so don't forget to post your uh, questions in the discussion below this video on both Facebook or YouTube to get our attention. And don't forget that you can view these sessions live, which are held live every Tuesday and Thursday um, as a replay available on Facebook and YouTube. So if we have some questions from the audience, our first question is actually from YouTube. Thank you to our joiners on YouTube. Can agrotourism combat the food security issues enough to actually make a difference? Or do we need to place a heavier emphasis on agriculture alone? That's an interesting one. All right. So, uh, yeah. Can agrotourism combat the food security issues enough to actually make a difference? Or we need to place a heavier emphasis on agriculture? Because of the way, I would say, or due to the way that our econ economy, the Barbian economy is already structured with its heavy dependence on tourism and the revenue that tourism brings into the island, I am, I am suggesting that tourism can be a platform, a way of messaging to the authorities and everybody else that if you start to look at food security, you do it both, of course, for the na for national interest, but you use tourism as a means to an end. For the last 60 years, we use tourism as an end. It is the end in of itself, it's the product. Mm -hmm. I'm saying switch that, that where tourism becomes the means, the platform to create linkages with the other sectors. And, you know, if we got, percep we got a perception history, his issue with history and stigma and all of that, and I'm just suggesting that because you can use the agriculture platform, you can look at the value added part, the, 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 the make the food sexy or trendy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it gives it more legs, not that it should only be the way, but it, it would give our culture much more legs. Let, let, me, let me also highlight an issue. And uh, there's no fault of anybody, it's not a criticism, but just an observation. There is a $200 million fund just released by the central bank or the, the Ministry of Finance to help mm -hmm. tourism recover. Doctor, yeah. But there's only $25 million for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, just leave that open there. Or maybe I would like to make a suggestion that we should probably create just as much incentives and stimuli for agriculture. Okay. If you put $10 million or $50 million or how much of a million dollars more into agriculture, maybe people would move investment away from the coast into the inland. Mm -hmm. and do agrotourism or uh, green tourism or agriculture or you know uh, and, and maybe that's also maybe a slight change in the, in the way that we think about our economy mm -hmm. so i'm just be, and because i mean me personally i mean this is about this is my own personal journey is i've come through tourism i use in tourism You've seen both uh, as, as, as the vehicle to diversify because mm -hmm. i am in the hotel industry and i take funds out of ocean spray to create Cocoa Hill. That was the only way I could do it. So I, that's the journey on my own part. Hope that answers the question. I'm sure, I'm sure it did. <laughs> then, uh, there's also something I'd like to talk about too. <clears throat> the first half of this presentation, I've been talking about Cocoa Hill and myself. I do not operate in a vacuum. I want to say that. Oh, um, does. 
I, I want to give uh, respect to, to projects like um, Walker's Reserve and Peg, and 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 I'm, and I'm sure the other people I don't know, I don't, I can't remember the names right now, but it's not only Coco Hill that's doing this. This is this is a trend. This is something happening now for seven years, mm -hmm. where uh, CPR has been doing an amazing work, and that co that collab that we did several times honestly was transformative for me because I realized that there are a lot of people that would help and, 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 and want to learn and want to even have an idea. Absolutely. And so, so, so the, 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 the next stage or the other thing that we need to do is to create linkages among ourselves, among everybody um, uh, who, you know, who's trying to, to, to imagine a different economic model. Okay. So I want to give respect to everybody who's, who's a soldier. <laughs> the soldiers. We definitely, uh, we, that's one of the main things that we do promote through Wired and CPRI um, partnerships. Uh, it, it's really the core, the, the crux of the whole thing. Without each other, we wouldn't be able to support what's going on and, and we wouldn't be able to make a difference. So thank you. Um, so our next question is actually from Facebook, uh, Rohan. What has been the major challenge with the project so far? So I believe he's talking about Coco Hill and um, have you been able to find a solution? Um, main challenge I would say in the beginning was the lack of buy-in from local uh, business structures like banks and lending agencies uh -huh. and even the hotel industry itself. Uh, but I must say that the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. has been a big supporter, which might seem contradictory, mm -hmm. but in fact they're very interested in the whole idea of agro-tourism. I would say the, the, the general business sector still have this idea that agriculture doesn't work, um, even in lending institutions. I remember bringing a banker down there and he basically told me like, Mahmoud, how you want me to value coconut trees and land? Yeah. So I would say that's one of the challenge, is that we need to start thinking, how do you, how do you value or monetize non, non-tourism projects or non-industrial non projects? Yeah. And the solution, what I what I what I start to realize is that I reach out to the foreign press, mm -hmm. uh, use social media and so on to create allies. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to have worked. The idea of volunteerism, of volunteer tourism, uh, mm -hmm. reaching out to, to CPRI and and working with Peg and Walkers and so on, create alliances. Mm -hmm. uh, those Thank strategies you. started to work. And for sure, again, making the linkages with tourism. I mean, the cruise ship sector and, and uh, doing hikes and tours and the green therapy, started to create a respect thing that even then the local market started to realize that, wow, okay, this idea of agro-tourism can work. And then so some authorities start to pay attention to the idea that we don't only have to have projects on the coast. You can, you can look at rural tourism or inland tourism as well. So no, I don't. I don't have. I, I'm not profitable yet, or if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. But I could see a future. You can see a future for it. Excellent. Thanks for that. I hope it answered your question, Rohan. Do we have another question from our audience? Ready? Ah, Sarah. So the next, um, not to bring up a sore subject, but what are your thoughts on managing um, marauding monkeys? Already monkeys. Already monkeys. All right, this is a touchy one. When I first started the project, it was like, peace and love monkeys, we can live with the monkeys. Actually, the monkey has broke the project. Um, you know, we had 48 types of fruit trees. A pineapple takes 18 months to grow. Um, and you can lose your whole pineapple crop in one night. Yeah. Just like that. Same thing with the mangoes, uh, bananas, cocoa, coffee, pomegranates, passion fruit. I mean, the list is long, 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 long. Um, so of, of course, because I'm doing fruit trees, or that was the idea, uh, my my take on the monkeys obviously changed and evolved. Um, so I can be really yeah. blunt, totally, totally blunt. I have more respect for rats and mongooses now because at least the rat and the mongoose will eat when they're hungry. The monkey doesn't do that. Um, and so it's, for me, it's a difficult thing. I mean, 
you know, you could say that the monkey is an invasive species. There's no predator. Um, completely out of hand. If you really want to talk about food security, we need to find a solution more than lip service to the monkey issue. And I don't know what that is. Is that culling? Is that some kind of um, control method? I am not sure. Uh, I'm not sure that I want to say what I really think publicly. <laughs> but it's a big, 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 big problem. Do you feel that the problem, that the solution to the problem is coming from the top down government? Is it a, is it a policy issue? You see, again, it's, I, I think it's a policy policy issue, and in some in some ways, I think we have diver, we have deferred the monkey to tourism and not agriculture. Mm -hmm. You know, and to me, that's a vision a vision issue or a policy issue. And so we have backed off the the monkey because tourists like to see them, but we need to eat. So somewhere in there, I I suppose is happy medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's to decide what the happy medium is. Yeah. It's a very controversial subject, that's for sure. So our next question from the audience is actually from Sveta. Do you need a big team to work on an agro-tourism project like yours, or and can you describe yours? So maybe give us a bit of a background, the size, the the, the scope of, of Cocoa Hill Forest. Uh, that's a good question, actually. When I first mapped out uh, Cocoa Hill, I think when the, the project is completely realized, we could employ at least 20 persons. And those will be people in botanists, agriculturalists, um, even a geographer, because the soil profile on the land is very unique. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're talking about the Scotland district area, you have the George Rivers formation, there's Manjak down in there, there's a whole set of uh, sedimentary and oceanic muds there. Um, and, and then you, the whole idea of the repository and the preservation of, of our flora could could involve ecology as well. Uh, it could be a, almost a small museum up there because we find a lot of pottery and artifacts from different types of people. I suspect Amerindian and the slave times and then poor slavery as well, um, meaning uh, poor whites or whatever. Uh, it suggests that people work that land many, many generations now. And so, there's even the idea of a, a treehouse hotel, you know, or another mm -hmm. kind of accommodation in the forest itself. You have rangers, you could have agriculturalists, like I said, uh, botanists, and then you could have chefs. I mean, one of the things that I would like to do is to have a cafe up there, totally experimental, serving foods like, like roots and barks and, and all the green stuff that we have in the Caribbean, bush medicine, for instance. Um, so the possibility, I would say, is there's is, is a lot to be realized if we could have the, the chance to realize it. Um, so when I mapped it out, I would say at least 20 persons. Unfortunately, sometimes we do it with four persons, one person, or sometimes part-time. It depends on ocean spray cash flow, really, um, mm -hmm. which is ad hoc. And you know, because of a small hotel, it, it takes time. Um, and we could even have machinery down in there, like to do all the terracing. I mean, we could, if, we, if we're able to terrace the whole valley, the food, the food production will go exponentially from right. where we are now. And that, that, that could be a whole other industry in itself. The idea of terracing, like how you see in Southeast Asia or other parts of the world. So 53 acres and, and there are segments in the actual 53 acres. Part of it is the rainforest that we will keep pristine and, and maybe only do green therapy in there. But the valley itself could lend to a whole new type of agriculture. And then again, mixing it with the agro processing, the small factory growing, making all the byproducts, and then the cafe with the experimental food. Excellent. Hope that answered your question, Svaita. It's it's a huge project, and to be really honest, Mahmoud is not uh, giving you the full scope. He's mostly a one-man show out there, doing a lot of the work by hand. So we're we're very happy when CPRI can come out and give you a hand with a, a group of twenty people or so. Twenty people with shovels makes a huge difference out, out there at Coco Hill. So our next question from the government is from Shane. Good afternoon, Shane. When you were looking at for land around Barbados, what features were preferred for your project? Was topography and fertility of the land a major concern at that stage? That's a very good question. Don't take it down because I need to break it down. Um, yeah. So yes, the first challenge was actually finding land 
of and itself. And if you if you as if you want to do farming, you know you're not talking about a hundred thousand square feet or two acres or whatever. If you want to do it in a big way, you need you need land. Um, unfortunately, uh, most of the flat land in Barbados is super expensive because we don't really have a strict zoning um, protocol in Barbados, so land can shift between agriculture and development very quickly. Um, and so. It, it, in the, I would say that Cocoa Hill happened in a reverse way. The, this uh, this uh, possibility of this profile of land was presented to me, and then I found solutions to deal with it. It was the land that I could afford to buy. It was, but it's you know has major issues with erosion because of the monoculture sugarcane practices that was done years ago, and so then I evolved um, an agricultural methodology to suit the land profile. And I would, and I, yeah, I think that's what, of course, is challenging, but it makes it also very interesting. So, uh, because of the slippage, then we had to do drainage and, and terracing. So we we took land that was probably not very fertile, and then through the regenerative agriculture, using chicken manure and chop and drop, um, start to refertilize the land. And so, yes, topography and fertility are major issues. I mean, 300 years of sugarcane means that effectively there's no potassium and magnesium in our soil, it's fairly sterile, um, but their regenerative agriculture lends a solution, or permaculture lends a solution to refertilize land. And it's very difficult. And so I would say that it doesn't matter where you find your piece of land, is to look then for the solutions that can make your land fertile and, and regenerate the land. And there's lots of examples or methodologies that you could adapt to rehabilitate your land. I mean, for instance, on St. Saint Philip, I would plant aloe vera, you know, if, if you have a problem with sea blast, because it lends itself to that, and sheep, maybe black belly sheep and aloe vera. So you find the land and then you find solutions to the problems the land present you. And I think that was the way that I, I um, went about doing it. Absolutely, I love that. It's certainly through the even the three um, examples that you gave already. Your property being on the east coast, sloping land, um, developing forest or existing forest. Sorry, peg farm, existing uh, farmlands which had been monocrop for many many years, and then Walker's Reserve, a, a, sand, a silicon sand sand mine quarry. Um, all of these are being regenerated using agriculture. Uh, sorry, permaculture principles. Um, or a variety of various different regenerative agriculture principles. Um, so the possibilities are there. It doesn't really matter what your starting point is. These are all ver a variety of different starting points. We seem to have lots of questions from our audience, so I'd like to get to a few more. Our next one is from Von Luke. Um, what kinds of response have you had from other local or international tourism hospitality businesses to your approach to tourism? Von, sadly to say, We've had more a positive response for international tourism than the local hotel industry. I belong to the local hotel industry, but it's sad to say. And uh, I remember going out to Frandeses and Concierge and talking about that. Not, yeah, Not let's leave it like that. And what I've had to do though is reach out to the international press to create media around it. You know, it's the old maxim in Barbies, you gotta go outside and get famous before somebody will pay you any attention. Mm -hmm. We have used that method, honestly, Forbes magazine, Vice magazine, etc., to create a an, an noise and an, an media um, to feed back into our local tourism industry. Mm -hmm. It's sad that it does have to work that way, but it, it seems to be the, uh, the yeah. norm. Perfect. So have we, um, have we got another question from the audience? Hope that answered your question, Von Luke. Um, in, in, if there are more questions, you know, please feed them through to our Instagram page, um, Coco Hill Forest on Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, gladly um, answer the questions. Absolutely. So our next question is actually from um, Goodridge. Have you considered hydroponics and aquaponics? Um, that's a very good question. Initially. I looked at those models, but again, the land at Cocoa Hill is like this. 
it's it's a valley yeah it's two big valleys really and so there's not a lot of flat land so it lends itself more to terracing and fruit trees um and again i'm i may be a little bit old-fashioned i like to put seeds in the ground and see food grow out of earth so that's not my personal journey but I would suggest for Barbados on the whole, because we have limited access to land, that vertical farming using hydroponics and aquaponics is a method that should be extremely expo explored or seriously you know, taken into consideration because it fits with smaller land profiles. Mm -hmm. Just that my personal mission at Coco Hill is slightly different because of the terrain that was afforded me. So I would say, no, not not really. I've looked at it in the beginning, but it's not the journey that I would make personally, I'm making personally, but I see a big value for that nationally, especially with land um, constraint issues. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. So our next question is from Barbados Scuba. Is there a potential for small businesses in the North, East, West? to sell Cocoa Hill juices and breads, which would also create awareness of your forest. So your value added products, how far reaching are they at the moment? Okay, so good question. Um, our challenge there is that we have not reached scale to market yet because of monkeys. It is, it is a horrible problem. We should have been able to sell through a farm shop, uh, even at the hotel to, to, to general public. And so we've only been able to supply to the cafe itself because of how devastating the, the, the monkey problem is. Imagine that you, it's 53 acres of forest, but around it is also more forest. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of monkeys in this year. Sometimes I think even up to about 200. Um, if we could fix that problem and then we could find funding for the agro-processing plant, for sure, for sure, your question would work. I mean, we would do uh, uh, farmers markets or direct to small entities. Correct. In, in fact, I want to make a point here that part of the problem, and this is going to be slightly controversial, is our distribution system that exists in Barbados, meaning the larger supermarkets and so on, bringing in cheap imported food. So I hope never to sell to that distribution model. I would much prefer to sell to small uh, small holders or small fruit sellers or small shops or whatever, or farmer's market. This is just my personal journey. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Our next question is from Naya. Which fruit was the most challenging for you to grow and how did you overcome the challenges? Have you considered introducing fruits that are not common to the Caribbean? Very good question, Naya. Um, I would say almost every fruit tree that is not typical was a learning journey, like learning how to grow coffee, uh, mm -hmm. learning how to grow cocoa, learning how to grow back pineapples because we used to grow pineapples in Barbados. Mm -hmm. I, I think even Lijon thinks that, you know, pine there were pineapples originally from Barbados. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we had our own pineapples here in the Caribbean, certainly Antigua Black, um, it's a known Caribbean variety. Um, so each of these crops were, was a learning curve because you now have to work out soil type, which what, what, what uh, environment it would grow in and so on. There was not a lot of literature available, um, at least not in a practical way. And so, yes, we made mistakes sometimes growing, for instance, uh, curry leaf in the wrong type of soil. Mm -hmm. I had to do everything, even the Mediterranean fig. I know we made tons of mistakes there. So uh yes you, you you know for each fruit tree it has its own environment its own type of soil and you have to try and work out what's the best fit and then companion growing because some trees don't like to grow with other trees all of that was a learning curve um the second part of the question i find more interesting and yes 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 we would love coco hill actually to become a repository of tropical fruit trees and flora and to you know um find seeds from the tropical world and bring it here in Barbados. So things like Loqua and Promision and, and a whole my, myriad uh, types of other fruit trees that for some reason we never did. So for instance, I went to a, a big nursery in Florida, South Florida, um, 
And the guy has 127 varieties of mangoes. And he was able to then have mangoes that you could produce all year round. Mm -hmm. right? And I was experimenting and doing grafting and so on. I think he had at least about 18 types of avocados, wow. et cetera. And then a, a whole set of sapodillas and so on. What I think, we have dropped the ball in terms of our agricultural science in Barbados. I know we had one time a really good sugar cane breeding station. But for some reason, we never did that with the the, the, the flora, with the fruit trees and and, um, and 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 the herbs and so on. The English bought whatever they bought here, and it and it got stuck there. So if they had the Barbados cherry, that was it. And if they had, I don't know, breadfruit, that was it. But we have never gone to the other tropical parts of the world and bring other stuff that might suit better after research or with interbreeding or grafting, mm -hmm. and then. Have, you know, uh, avocados all year round, or mangoes all year round, etc. So that's a part of research. There is a big possibility of doing research in that direction, bringing other flora and, and fruit trees from around the tropical world. That would be very interesting to see that happen at Cocoa Hill. That would be an amazing thing. I think we have about time for just one more quick question. Um, this one comes in from YouTube as well. How could you? How could one get the best use of coconuts at home? Oh. I, I maybe need more help to understand that question. Uh, but how can you get maybe just some of the ways that you're making use of your coconuts um, okay. and, and some of the things that a person could use with them at home? Well, I call coconut the tree of life. So you can get coconut water. You can get coconut milk, coconut oil, coconut sugar, coconut alcohol. You can use it in baking. You can make your sauces or your uh, paste from it. Um, like when we do coconut bread, which is coconut bread, we would add ginger in the, in, the, in the mix and obviously add more coconut so it becomes really a coconut ginger bread. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can make your milks from it and there's, you can go online and see uh, homemade practical ways of making coconut milk. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, use it in cereals, toast, you know, shred it and then toast it a little bit. And then you make that into your muesli or granola with other stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose going online and seeing the 800 ways that you could uh, use coconuts. Absolutely. The web, the, the internet is a huge resource. And don't forget that after you've used all the insides of the coconut, you can absolutely use the outside as mulch. I've seen Mahmoud certainly uses a lot of coconut as mulch at uh, Cocoa Hill as well. In so, fact, yes, I'm um, sorry about that. I mean, coconut husk is a big byproduct for us. We actually have a grinder there, and we would encourage other guys that sell coconuts on, on, on the highways and so on to some of them to come and bring the shells there and let me grind it up into a compost. Um, so the, the whole coconut has so many uses. Coconut is gold. Coconut is gold. If, if there's one thing that you take away today, coconut is gold, everyone. Um, I think we have time for just one more quick question, if there's a quick one available. Maybe not. Mahmoud, why don't you let us know how we can all get in touch with you at Cocoa Hill? How can we come out and see it once we're able to move around again, um, or, or even in small numbers? How can we get involved with what's going on at Cocoa Hill? And tell us a bit about how we can get in touch with you at Ocean Spray as well. Right. So once once we get past the uh, COVID protocols and we can open back up in, in, in whatever methodology, um, definitely I would say that Cocoa Hill could be a space that people can go to and breathe out and breathe in. Uh, it's very green. It's very therapeutic. So welcome. And, and for sure, we would have, you know, really an attractive way to, to come and experience that. Uh, Cocoa Hill Forest at Gmail. Um, mm -hmm. It's on Instagram, it's Cocoa Hill Forest on Facebook, and you and um, um, uh, TripAdvisor as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't have a website yet. Um, that was a funding issue. Mm -hmm. And at Ocean Spray, our cafe, I unfortunately, is going to probably be closed for a longer time. Mm -hmm. I'm not that's sure certainly yeah. when that will reopen. Um, mm -hmm. That's going to be a challenge. But hopefully, maybe by November, December, um, one of the things that we did though, and if you want to, once we can open back up uh, with social distancing, is uh, maybe starting back the Perma Blitz, where we were doing every six weeks, and you know, anybody could come and join and sign up. 
and we do a small talk around what I'm doing, and then we go out in the actual field and, and maybe plant some trees or do some terracing or. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. That's a, a collaboration between CPRI, uh, One Tree for Every Bajan, and um, Cocoa Hill Forest, where uh, some volunteers come out during the day and we offer a bit of education. Mamu gives a bit of a talk about what we're doing. Um, we offer some skill learn, some skill building and some permaculture skills. And we ask for some assistance during the day. And Mahmoud feeds us a fantastic uh, lunch when we're all finished. So it's it's usually a really great day. We meet we meet great friends, and um, uh, it's it's green therapy while doing a bit of garden therapy is what I like to call it. It's really an amazing time. So we look forward to opening that back up again as well as soon as we are able to. Um, I think that that's a, a, one of the things that uh, the general public is going to look to get back into sooner rather than later. Um, so I want to really thank you so much for taking the time today, Mahmoud. It's been really enlightening. Um, all of your perspectives on agro-tourism, agro-processing, these are all ideas that we're all going to take well into our very near future, I think. Um, congratulations on everything that you've done so far at Cocoa Hill. Uh, it's it's an amazing project. I know you have a long way to go in your in your own head, but I, I think that you are most of the way there. So thank you very much for joining us. And thank you as well to our audience. Um, if you missed any of today's session, you can always watch the replay on Wired or CPRI's Facebook page. And please subscribe to Wired's YouTube channel for access to all of our upcoming sessions. Thanks to everyone who also joined in today on our YouTube channel. That was amazing. This Thursday, you can watch Wired's Keisha Farnham as she will have the pleasure of chatting with the renowned artist Annalee Davis. Annalee's practice looks at the intersection of biography and history and delves into the topics of regenerative agriculture, biodiversity preservation, and climate resilience throughout her work. Thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Please keep safe, stay home, and tune in on Thursday at 11. And from next week, you can join us on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Thanks, and see you next time.